anyway, real pleasure to be here again, and it's a beautiful campus. I went for a nice walk and saw a river otter this morning, and you can't do that in New York, so good on you. Um, but I, and thanks for the introduction. It started to get a bit miserable there. The first extinction, then all the frogs are dying out, and then... So I'll try not to be too morbid and miserable, but I do have a morbid fascination for diseases that are wiping things out. Um, and what I really want to talk about today is how we've tried to use ecology and bring ecology in, and health together. Really, hard, the hard science of ecology, um, the, the type of approach that analyzes complex systems to understand how dynamics change and then how that affects disease. And I think this is a sort of new field that's been really developing rapidly. And I want to show a few examples of how we've used that to solve some problems. And I'm going to start with... Maybe I'm not going to start. There you go. No. Yes, I am. I'm going to start with the first miserable case of extinction due to an infectious disease. Now, these are snails, so they're not the most charismatic species, and people often don't care. But I, I found this really interesting. A few years ago, when I was in England, um, a friend of mine at London Zoo phoned me up and said, we've got real problems, all the snails keep dying out. And we used to have a joke about it. We'd go around to the invertebrate house, and these guys were the most poorly treated zookeepers in the zoo, because no one was interested in invertebrates. They wanted to go and see the pandas. But they were obsessed with their snails. And I realized why. Some of these snails are extinct in the wild, and these are called Partula tree snails from the islands of the South Pacific. And there were, a group of them went extinct because people introduced a giant African land snail as a food source, and then they introduced a predatory snail to kill that one when the giant African land snail started eating all the crops. And that big snail, the, the, the predatory snail couldn't really kill it. So what it went for instead were these beautiful little tree snails, and it basically ate a third of a genus to extinction. But luckily, a few were kept in zoos around the world, and uh, everything was good for a few years, and people started noticing that populations were dropping in zoos, and then they'd bounce back up and they'd drop. And because there's snails that could go down to one individual animal left in a zoo, and the hermaphrodites, they could have babies and bounce back from one, which is pretty incredible. So I got involved in this when there was a, um, an, an extinction event happening, and this is the animal. It's the last ever of that species to exist on the planet. So it's quite exciting. You go around there, and there's these zookeepers who are obsessed with this. They've got this little plastic box. And I remember going in, and uh, this guy was cleaning the cage, and he said, here, hold this, will you? And he was sort of ignoring me. I thought, well, I've wasted all my time. Boring snails, about 14 of them in a little box. And he carried on cleaning. He said, by the way, you know you're holding a whole species in your hand. That was incredible. You know, what a powerful moment. So this poor uh, species, Partula turgida, actually died out. It didn't bounce back. And it died on January the 1st, New Year's Day, 1996. Probably really died a couple of weeks earlier, but the zookeepers couldn't tell if it was alive or dead. So they kept... <laughs> They kept a little diary, you know, it's quite sad. You'd go around there. We knew it was dead, and we wanted to get in there and do a necropsy on it and see what killed it, but they wouldn't let us because they thought it was still alive. That little diary, still not moved. We're getting to really worry about Partula turgida. <laughs> Eventually, they scraped it off the side of the cage, and it was dead. And what killed it were these little um, microsporidium parasites in the liver, the, the, the snail's equivalent of a liver. A raging infection, you can see the um, little... Sp uh, groups of spores in the, in the um, digestive gland cells and whoops when you look at them on electron microscope you can see they've got this coil which is characteristic of a microsporidium parasite and you know we thought this was quite interesting there's an extinction happened in London in the zoo um, we told the zoo about it we said we really should publish this and get some PR on it they didn't want any PR that the zoo was killing out species so that didn't work but they did put an obituary in the London Times. Partula turgida died at the hand of man, New Year's Day, 1996. It was a sad moment all round. And it turned out that was the first time we could ever say a species definitively went extinct because of an infectious disease. I thought it was really interesting. But when you look around, there are a lot more examples of this. And I started getting fascinated by why would a disease cause the extinction of its host? Because once it kills off its host, it's got nowhere to go. It, it goes against any common sense for a parasite. But this has happened repeatedly. Another uh, example is in Hawaii. This is um, 
what Hawaii looks like now, the land cover there. This is what it used to look like before humans got involved. Beautiful native forest with these amazing species of honeycreepers um, from, the, from the gorgeous scarlet eevee to the um, rare and unobtrusive little pa'uli there. Now, in about 1860, I think, people introduced mosquitoes to Hawaii. And we even know exactly which ship brought in the mosquitoes. And there's a famous story of a colonial ship that came in with a barrel of water full of mosquito larvae, put it into the local stream, and now mosquitoes established. And the Culex quinquefasciatus mosquito that established was able to act as a, a vector for avian malaria. And that went on to wipe out Hawaiian birds. And you can see there the mosquito feeding on the, just the eyelid of an eevee. Now, why is it that this happens? Well, it happens because of globalized trade. And back then, it was colonial times, more and more ships traveling to Hawaii and taking these uh, mosquitoes onto the island. And, and because the birds on Hawaii had never experienced anything like it before, there was no natural capacity, there was no na naive innate immunity to deal with this type of pathogen. And we know that because some experiments done um, by the National Wildlife Health Center here in the States showed that if you infect native Hawaiian birds with, with um, avian influenza, uh, avian uh, malaria, you get 60% or higher mortality rates. If you infect the introduced bird species, you get much lower mortality rates. Those introduced species that are now all across Hawaii in the lowland act as a reservoir. They can get infected by malaria, they can carry the disease, but they don't die out. So it's, it's the reservoirs and the introduction event that led to the extinction of these birds. And what's happened now is that the birds, some birds are still out there. In fact, one went extinct about five or six years ago. The Pu'uli, it was down to three individuals, and there was a big effort to try and capture those individuals. I think there were two females and one male. They, they all had territories outside of each other's range, so they didn't know each other existed. Three individuals on the world left. So they went out there, captured them, brought them into captivity, and they all died out within a few weeks of avian malaria. So a really tragic story. What, what happens now, when you go to Hawaii, you won't see any of these um, endangered native birds down in the lowlands because it's really good habitat for mosquitoes. So if you look at the elevation, um, mosquitoes do really well in the lowlands. As it gets higher up the mountainside and gets cooler, mosquitoes can't survive very well. They can't breed up in big enough numbers. And eventually, you don't see any mosquitoes. And that's where the habitat and the birds, the native birds, live. And the introduced birds do really well down in the lowlands. So they're still hanging on there. But of course, what we have now is an extinction event with maybe a third or two thirds of that genus disappeared. And another threat, which is climate change, because if you look at the capacity for climate change to warm up the environment in Hawaii, this is the range of one of those native birds. This is the tip of the habitat that's suitable for mosquitoes now. Under the climate change scenarios over the next few years, mosquitoes are going to invade the whole, more or less, of the territory of that bird and potentially wipe them out due to avian malaria. So there's a real extinction event happening. And this has been repeated all around the world. The reason why those snails in London Zoo died out was because people brought other snails into the zoo that had those parasites that could act as reservoirs. And then their obsession with cleaning the cages from one to another to another actually transmitted the parasite around the collection. So there are some real problems in the world. And you get these classical rapid die-offs of species due to introduced diseases. Now, when, when we started working on this many years ago, it was really just an interesting thing and uh, didn't really get much publicity or much scientific interest. But then in the 70s and the 80s, herpetologists noticed that amphibians were sort of disappearing from their favorite places. They'd go to protected areas in Costa Rica and Panama or in northern Queensland in Australia where they'd been seeing really good, healthy fog populations for 20 years. They'd do the surveys, and there'd be no frogs left. And there was this sort of enigmatic declines that were happening in the wild, and no one really understood what was going on. And in those days, ecologists and veterinarians never really spoke to each other. There was not much connection. Um, ecologists didn't really do much on infectious disease. And they looked at disease as a sort of 
event that would take out the very weak animals in a, in a population, or the very young, or the very old, and not really be a significant impact on a, on a population level. And veterinarians tended not to work on wildlife. And you know, UC Davis is one of the foremost wildlife health um, schools of veterinary medicine in the planet. So you're at the forefront of this. So back in um, 1996, when this species went extinct, and this is a, um, called Pterodactyl secuti rostris. It's an Australian frog, the sharp-snouted day frog. It's got a very unfortunate name. Um, <laughs> But it's, again, another sad story. And it always happens to be these little boring brown ones that disappear that no one really cares about. I feel quite sad for this animal. These are a series of transects. Ecologists go out into the field and they walk along transects and they count the number of amphibians they see. And they do repeat these transects over and over again and you get a measure of the population. At least you can compare from one season to the next where the population's moving up or down. And frog populations fluctuate anyway. But what happened with these frog populations is they all suddenly dropped off and died out. A few survived, a few species did okay, but at, at this point, simultaneously, at, in the same place, three different species of frogs completely disappeared. And in fact, this little blip is the last ever known adult, and this is it right here. Now, we, got, we were lucky enough to be working on um, diseases and finding examples of, of new diseases emerging in wildlife. And we got sent the last three tadpoles, and this is another very miserable story. Um, in one of the ponds that you can identify this, these tadpoles from this Tadactyl secuti rostris, the last three left, and they were taken into captivity as a last ditch attempt. They were going to metamorphose and live and breed, and every, everything was going to be okay. The minute they metamorphose, they started to show weird signs of a disease, and then they died out. So we got those individuals, and we looked at them, and we found what turned out to be a, a new disease, a new type of fungus that was killing amphibians in Australia and in Panama and now has been reported just about globally as a cause of amphibian declines. This is one of the first few um, frogs from a big collection of frogs across Australia that was made by a veterinarian called Lee Berger. And um, it's actually a dead frog. And, they, and I always say this is like a, the Monty Python sketch where John Cleese goes into the pet shop with his dead parents says, excuse me, sir, my parrot's dead. And the guy says, no, it's not, it's just resting. He's, he's okay, he'll perk up. Well, it looks a bit like that. You know, you can't really see, as you look at that, any, any gross signs of, a, of, a, of an infection. And, you know, the fact that it's frozen solid and not moving is the only thing that's wrong with it. And I know that it's dead because this is what they look like when they're alive, most of the time. <laughs> But if you look carefully, you'll see on the surface of the frog some thickening of the skin and sloughing of the skin, really thick areas of, of keratinaceous cells on the skin. So we looked at this, and what we found is that in those areas of thickening, you get this, these fungal spores inside the individual cells. If you look at a scanning electron micrograph, you can see this little flask-shaped spore-producing uh, structures. And this is uh, called a chytrid fungus. It's a very primitive type of fungus. It doesn't have hyphae. It's a sort of single-celled fungus. And it turns out it's the first time a, a, a chytrid has ever been shown to infect a vertebrate. Um, it lives only on keratinized cells on frogs. So the tadpoles don't have keratin. As soon as they metamorphose, they grow a layer of keratin. The fungus invades and kills them. And it turns out it's the, uh, it's the cause of amphibian declines pretty much globally. And, and, you know, it, it's a case in point that it took almost 10 years for us to convince the ecological community that this was an important disease. And, you know, we understood diseases. We'd seen it so many times in London Zoo and in other wildlife populations. But to convince ecologists that it wasn't a toxin or UV light or climate change or some other event that they're used to dealing with was really tough. And the real clincher for this was, Lee, uh, was Karen Lips, who... Did, did an amazing bit of work. She went out to um, a site near the canal, and she knew that there was a wave of amphibian mortality moving year by year towards the Panama Canal, wiping out frogs as it went. And she started doing transects there regularly and testing for this disease. And what you see is her transects results year after year. And you can imagine by now the team is really bored. You've done five years of this and nothing's happening. Everything is normal. You don't find any results. Then suddenly they start to see the first few infected frogs and the whole population just 
falls off the edge of a cliff. And if you go to those sites now, you know, four or five years on, six years on, there are still no frogs at those sites. So this is a, a really nasty multi-species die-off. So what's causing a, a global emergence of a disease in wildlife? And we know from the Hawaii example that introduced diseases cause rapid declines, just like the amphibians. We know from London Zoo and other zoos that you, when you introduce an infect, a new infectious agent into a zoo, you get these massive die-off events. Could something like that be happening? Is there a global trade in frogs that could be doing it? And we didn't realize there was, but when you start looking at it, there is this huge trade in frogs. In fact, if you go to um, some of the restaurants that serve frogs like here in the States, you're actually eating bullfrogs, North American bullfrogs. So you probably shouldn't do it. It's pretty horrible. Um, but they're not only bullfrogs, they're actually bred in parts of Asia and parts of Latin America. The frogs taken from the States over there, bred and then shipped back live. So it's a perfect system for spreading a disease. So we went out to these farms and we got to know some of the farm keepers. And this is a really nice family in Taiwan who are just trying to make a, make a bit of money out of a frog farm. They've got about a million frogs in this tiny family farm. And you see they're just thick with frogs and the you know, it's, it's pretty unhygienic, and um, it's really a perfect way for a disease to spread. These frogs are full of this pathogen, and they ship their frogs live into parts of the USA, LA. Um, sometimes they skin them, which is actually probably better, because then you remove all the keratin and you remove the pathogen. But sometimes they just bag them up and ship them over, and then you get a fresher frog. So what a great way for a pathogen to spread. This is a farm in Brazil. It's a bit more organized, and it's sort of becoming a globalized intensive agriculture production system. Each of these pits contains a few hundred North American bullfrogs. And the water goes in there, and then it sluices out into the local river system. So again, perfect for disease to spread. So that's why we're getting these events. People are just doing unusual things that we didn't really think about as a, as a risk for health. It turns out bullfrogs can get infected and survive the infection. So they're great carriers for this pathogen. And we thought we really wanted to do something about it. And I, I run a, a, a nonprofit that does scientific research, but also tries to do something with that research and change policy or make a difference. So we thought, how can you stop this from happening? Now, there's a group in the States um, that's trying to do an activist thing. There's, you might see them in California outside um, chains of Mexican restaurants that sell frog's legs, protesting frog's legs. That's one way of doing it. We thought we'll, we'll try and get really good scientific evidence and we'll go to the World Trade Organization who have the OIE, which is the, the World Organization for Animal Health, and they have legislation to stop the trade of animals that have got infections. So things like hoof and mouth disease or mad cow disease. They're the organization that will block the trade out of Canada or the US when you get a mad cow. Um, so could we do something about frogs with this organization? So first of all, we went, went out to get some data. And we went down to Chinatown in, in New York, in LA, and San Francisco, and we bought frogs. And we swabbed them, and we tested them for a couple of frog diseases, this fungal disease and a, a disease called ranavirus. And what we found was really high prevalence. So we're looking at um, 30, 60 percent prevalence in, in these shops in, in LA, New York, and San Francisco. And we found this repeatedly. So we published a, a paper in Science saying we really need to do something about that, and you know, the world should take notice. There's an extinction event happening. We've known about it for 10 years, and nothing's been done to stop it. And thankfully, the, the OIE were interested, and we actually got this. We realized that they can list a disease as notifiable, which means a country has to declare whether it's infected or not and what it's doing to stop the trade and get rid of the disease. And they can do this if a disease is affecting um, animals that are traded for food, which frogs are, but also for ecological reasons. So we tried to use both angles on that. And the OIE have now passed this legislation. The US has signed up for it. So now there's going to be some movement to try and stop that trade. So I thought this was a real success. It's sort of odd, you know, for the, for the OIE to care about frogs. But I think it hopefully is the start of a new effort to do something about the wildlife trade. And, you know, we, we sort of very happy with the success of this. And we thought, well, what's the, 
what other things are being traded globally? And we went to US Fish and Wildlife and naively sent them an email and said, every year you collect data on every shipment of animals into the country. Could you give us the data and we'll do some analysis and we'll publish a paper and we'll try and do some of this? And well, no way, because those data belong to the people who bring these animals in, so it's protected information. It's commercial information. We're not allowed to give it to you. So we filed Freedom of Information Act requests. And they actually told us to do this. And we did this every year. We still do it every year now. And we got, got all their data. Um, and it's just incredible what we found. If you look at, this is a six year period. Um, lots and lots of fish. I think that's 13 million. Actually, is it 1,316,000,000 fish, individual fish coming into the US. I mean, there's not so many of the animals that we know are high risk, mammals, there's a lot less of those. But there's a lot of amphibians, there's a lot of um, reptiles, there they are. In fact, it's 1,458,000,000 animals in that six year period. It's 120 million animals a year coming into the US, individual animals, for the pet trade, for the food trade. And these are wildlife, usually caught in the wild or bred in farms like the one we saw in Taiwan. So it's a huge conservation issue, but it's also a huge health issue. And we thought we'd focus on this health side. And these are the sorts of things we say when we go to a, a policymaker and, and try and get them to do something about it. Um, it's the equivalent of, um, every New York, of, of 8 million New Yorkers, each one of them having 182 pets, which actually some of them do. You know, not, this guy's got quite a few, he's walking dogs. It's the equivalent of three pets per US household. And I remember talking to one congressperson, they said, well, how, why would people have three pets per US household? That's just not true. Well, what they forget is that two of them die. So then, you, you know, you keep doing this cycle. So it's a huge trade. And we published a paper on this in um, the CDC journal, Emerging Infectious Diseases. And what we did is we just simply listed the diseases that animals coming into the US could carry with them that are commonly found in these diseases. I remember again talking to Congress about it and saying, you know, this includes things like um, monkeypox and or Ebola. And one, one person said, well, th there's no way Ebola is going to come into the US. And I said, well, hang about. There's a, there's a, a strain of Ebola called Ebola Reston, uh, named after Reston in Virginia, where monkeys came in for lab purposes and brought Ebola with them. So yes, it could come in the US. And, and monkeypox came in and, and uh, killed people. In fact, here's a picture of the family in Wisconsin that bought um, I think they bought prairie dogs in a pet store that were infected from African rats that came in with monkeypox. And there's the, the little cute baby with her monkeypox lesion. That's pretty nasty stuff. That kills people. So this is a serious issue. And we're, we're going to try and do something about this on a bigger scale. But, but now we've got a problem because it's become a really hot topic. And it's become a hot topic not because of the health side, but because of introduced species. Things like the Burmese uh, pythons that are now living in the Everglades, they came from the pet trade, and they're now breeding in the Florida Ever Everglades, along with gnar monitors, giant geckos from Indonesia. Beautiful animals, by the way. I'm a great reptile fan, but they shouldn't be in Florida eating alligators or policemen. Um, and things like the lionfish on the reefs or the snakehead fish, which became a really big issue. And what's happened is the pet industry has realize that this is a big issue and they're concerned about it and they don't want their um, trade and their, uh, their, um, the people that they employ to lose the jobs because we're concerned about the health effects which aren't that common to be honest we don't often get diseases from these animals at least as far as we know so is there a way we can work around this where you can still have a pet trade um, and it's natural for people to want to keep pets. My daughters keep pets. I keep pets. I've got a gecko in my office, if you must know. It's captive bred, though, so it's good. But, you know, there is a way around it, and that's to captive breed these animals here in the States, make them disease-free, and maybe you could even sell them at a higher cost because they're healthier, they're sort of green animals. So this is what we're trying to do now. And we, we're launching a, a program in May called Pet Watch, and it's based on Seafood Watch, where you, know, you go into a restaurant, you want to order some fish, and you pull out your iPhone, and you click on your app, and you find, I shouldn't really eat the tuna because they dine out globally. Well, the same thing with this. You go into a, a pet store, you pull out your app, 
Should I buy little Joey a gecko or should I buy him a python? Well, the answer is the gecko, because it says we've hit in Petwatch. And we've got a, a, a group of scientists who've come together to go through the health implications of each animal that's in the trade, the um, conservation implications, and the sort of ethical implications. Do they do well in captivity? Are they easy to keep? Do they suffer in captivity? And we're trying to get a few of the pet industry involved in this, and some of them are beginning to come round. Now, I want to, I've talked a little bit about wildlife, and you know, diseases from wildlife also affect people. So, are there things we can learn from these ecological approaches in wildlife diseases that work on human diseases too, and have some value to stopping the next pandemic? And it's interesting, when you look at diseases of people, this is a, a big issue with us. Zoonoses, pathogens that come from wildlife, have been with us for a long, long time. They're part of our culture. You know, they go back to the biblical plagues. There's good evidence now that in biblical times, we came together in Old Testament times in just the right population density where we could support an infectious disease in our populations. So the biblical plagues probably had some truth to them. And then you look at bubonic plague in Europe, and you know, again, it reminds you of Monty Python sketches where guys are walking around, bring out your dead, you know, you've got bucket loads of dead people. Quarter of Europe died out in one single outbreak. And then another great globalization event when Cortez and the other conquistadors came to the New World and brought um, influenza, smallpox, and other diseases, and basically caused an extinction event in Native Americans living in South America, in some tribes anyway. Now, it's a great cultural thing for me as a British person. You know, we've got some amazing diseases in England. In fact, you could do a tour of England. I'm thinking of owning up my own business, where you go from, you know, the place where mad cow disease first emerged, then where we had salmonella outbreaks in eggs, you know, and then you could go to this place, which is just beautiful. There's even a beautiful illuminated manuscript that lists out every person who died during the plague of 1665 in a little village. And this is a little village you can go into the church and look at the graves. It's utterly morbid. Um, and this, in this village, people knew net by now, by the, 16, uh, by the 17th century, they knew the plague was infectious. They knew you could catch it from other people. Um, so this village was infected, and nowhere else around the area was. So they sealed themselves off. And when they wanted to buy food or clothing from surrounding villagers, they would deliver the food and they'd drop it off, and then they'd pay them by putting the money in a stream so they'd have to pick it up out of the stream. So first case of sterilizing quarantine. I don't know what you call it. Not very good, but I think it did work, actually. But of course, not for the people in this book. You could also, on my little tour of the UK, um, you could go to the Whitechapel Hospital, the home of the Elephant Man, which is a great, you know, you can see his skeleton. Um, and you can see this stained glass window, which is, I believe, the only stained glass window on, on the planet that celebrates um, the influenza outbreak, the great pandemic of 1918. This is the mortality curve for the influenza outbreak, this huge spike in mortality. And someone working there, one of the medics in the medical hospital, decided we'll have a stained glass window on that. This is one of the drugs that treats HIV. That's really cool. And I think it's important, it's more than just a joke, this is really serious. We, we've lived with diseases from wildlife. HIV is a wildlife pathogen, it's a chimpanzee virus. Um, a, uh, um, a, avian influenza, 1918 flu was probably an avian origin influenza virus. These diseases have been with us a long time. So what can we do about them? By understanding what happens in wildlife. If they come from wildlife, and ecologists work with wildlife, what can we do? Well, here's what we've been doing. Um, looking at a, a couple of examples. One is West Nile. Um, West Nile virus is really hard to predict. It got into the US, probably it got into New York, where I live now, it probably through um, air travel through mosquitoes, hitching a ride on planes. But now it's here in the States, it's here to stay, it's endemic, and it's really difficult to predict. This is New York, this is where I live, in Rockland County here. It's really hot for West Nile, so you sort of worry about it, but should I move here and I'm never going to get West Nile? Well, ne the next year you might get a huge spike in infections there. Is it sure there's a way we can predict what the outbreaks are going to be like for West Nile later on in the year, just by looking at what's happening in wildlife? Because this virus is a bird virus 
transmitted by mosquitoes that we occasionally get infected by. So we started to do this, and it's taken us about five years, but it's a, it, we now can predict things pretty accurately in, in our, at our field sites. So this is what West Nile virus looks like. It's a bird virus that's transmitted by mosquitoes. So in the bird, there's all these different factors that affect transmission. And as an ecologist, what you try and do is you try and understand the key factors that, that affect the dynamics of transmission for this pathogen. But there's a lot of them, and you can't measure everything. You can't measure every single effect. You can't go out and count every predator of birds in the, in the wild. I mean, there's hundreds of species out there. But what you can do is you can count birds. There's, there are ways to do that. You can catch them and sample them. And you can get a handle on most of these things by doing a few simple measurements. Collecting mosquitoes, measuring, uh, measuring their abundance, measuring the temperature, and measuring bird abundance and, and uh, prevalence of the virus in birds. One thing that we couldn't do is work out what mosquitoes fed on. Because if mosquitoes prefer one species over another, then we've got a real problem. And we don't, we don't know what that is yet. So this is what we tried to do. We set up a series of field sites, and we chose DC because we thought it would be really good to work in Washington, DC. We, had, we worked with the Smithsonian, and we worked on the Smithsonian Mall with the White House around here somewhere. Is that it there? Somewhere around there. Um, we thought this was really cool because maybe we can find the mosquitoes that are going to bite G.W. Bush <laughs> that year because that was when he was in power. And then we, we worked on this sort of urban to rural gradient out of DC into Maryland. And this is a Smithsonian field site in Jug Bay um, near um, in Maryland. It's a beautiful, pristine forest. And what we found that was really um, important was we got this, one of our collaborators said, well, you know what we can do now? We can, if you catch a mosquito with a blood meal in it, and if the blood meal's still there and it hangs around for a few hours, we can actually sequence the DNA in the blood meal and work out what species of bird that mosquito fed on. So we have, great, this is really good. So we collect hundreds of thousands of these mosquitoes every year. And we have people, and I did it for a bit, but then it was really boring work. You know, you look down there and you sift through this pile of mosquitoes. In fact, there's a pile right there. And you pull out the ones that look like they've got blood in and you, yeah, bloody mosquitoes. But that, that is the boring side of research. And what, what we found that was really cool is that mosquitoes specifically feed on just one or two reservoir of birds out of, the, out of this whole diversity. And once you know that, then suddenly you can predict things really accurately. There's a huge diversity of birds here in the intact forest, but when you get into these sort of suburban areas where West Nile is particularly high risk, you only have a few species. A lot of boring British birds that we brought over for some reason, the starling and sparrow and the pigeon, the beautiful American robin, cardinals, things like that. What we found is that Whatever the makeup of the, that diversity, the most preferred species was the American robin. And it turns out that American robins are really good. At, they get infected by West Nile. They produce a pile of virus in, in the blood when they've got a viremia. So when a mosquito bites them, the mosquito gets infected. They're really good at spreading the pathogen. So American robins are 33 times more important um, to West Nile virus dynamics than any other bird out there which is a bit unfortunate. Well, I'd say 33, but eight, between 8 and 31 times, um, at our, a, a, according to our field sites. Another way of saying it, British birds are like British food, Brussels sprouts. They're really dull to mosquitoes. And American robins are like really nice, rich German chocolate cake <laughs> to mosquitoes. But what we could do now is we could use u the usual ecological approaches, which is to analyze that, get a pile of data, create a mathematical model, and do a simulation that tells you what human cases you're going to get at that field site that year. And what we find is that our prediction, which is the black line, tells us we're going to get a really high peak of infection in early August to, to mid-August. And then that year that we did this prediction, we could then see the spike in cases, not many cases, but enough to see a spike just a couple of weeks afterwards. And I said to um, Mount Kilpatrick, who did all the mathematics, I said, well, you know, you really messed up on that math, because look, there's two weeks between the prediction and the actual. But of course, it takes two weeks for you to get ill, go to a doctor, get diagnosed. So it completely explains that gap. So now we have, using an ecology type approach, a great way to predict a disease that affects people. 
We've done the same for Nipah virus. This is a virus from bats, and there's a whole series of these viruses that are emerging from bats all around the world. These are really beautiful fruit bats from um, Australia, these, but Nipah virus emerged in Malaysia. SARS is a bat virus. Ebola um, originates in bats. So bats, for some reason, have a lot of nasty viruses. Nipah virus came and uh, affected people in Malaysia that worked in pig farms. So everybody thought it was a pig virus at first. But it's basically a bat virus that got into pigs and then affected people working with pigs. So we went out to Malaysia to try and understand why it emerged, the first case of, Mal of Malaysian Nipah virus. What is it that caused that? And this is the farm that was first infected in this beautiful countryside of Malaysia, really good fruit bat habitat. So the first thing we needed to do was to do some typical ecology stuff, which is catch some animals and bleed them and see what they've got. Turns out bats are really hard to catch, so I had a problem here because you've got to be able to climb trees. I'm not so good at climbing trees these days. Um, but we got this guy, he's a Welsh tree climber who lives in Malaysia. He still works for us now, 10 years later, called Tom Hughes. This is Tom hanging on a little branch. I'm down at the bottom sipping gin and tonic and tick. Good job. Um, and what he does is he strings up nets from one tree to the other. And we have to cut every individual bat, we have to lower it down on a winch, grab it, anesthetize it, bleed it, and release it later on. It's a nasty, it's a bat with big teeth and a nasty virus, so you have to wear special protective gear. This was Tom got a bit carried away that time. And it's also dangerous terrain, bad things can happen. You can set up a beautiful field camp and then things like that happen. The tide comes in and washes all your stuff away. But it's great fun and it's good classical ecological work. And what we found is that Nipah virus is all across Malaysia in, in bat colonies. So it's probably, it suggests that it's a, a virus that's been with bats for millions of years and is part of their natural um, microbiota. And we're really interested in this because one theory was that bats were moving into Malaysia with the virus because of climate change. And climate change makes um, the forest fires in Indonesia burn harder you get these big spikes in smog, and bats are notoriously irritated by smog, they fly away. So what we did is we attached satellite collars to these bats, and this one was called, um, I forget now, Colossus, after one of the X-Men. Don't ask me why. And what, what we wanted to know was, did they fly from Peninsula Malaysia, where the outbreak was, to Indonesia, as a normal part of their migration patterns? And sure enough, they do. And they basically, the first bat we caught did that. These two bats met on a beach in Thailand uh, over a glass of mango juice. <laughs> yeah, so they fly across borders. They don't care where they go. This is what, just one big happy hunting ground for fruit for them. And they happen to have this virus. So we thought, well, if it's not the bats, what is it? Why is this virus, why did it suddenly emerge? And of course, the reason is that it's the pig farms. There's been a sudden increase in the intensity of pig production in Malaysia. And um, what we did is we went to the original pig farm for Nipah virus, and we looked at every single bit of information from that pig farm. It's a really well-kept farm. It had 30,000 pigs at any one time, and they kept meticulous records. So it had all this amazing data. Um, and we knew the date at which each barn got infected and the date of every person who got infected. And what we were trying to understand was why it took so long for this virus to emerge. So we found that the first case was actually 97, and it took two years for the virus to emerge. So this virus was ticking over in this pig population, occasionally killing the odd person for two years. And what, then what happened is, by the end of 98, people realized something was wrong with these pig farms, and people were dying. So they tried to sell the pigs off, get rid of them, before things went bad and created a huge outbreak in another part of Malaysia. But what we did is we did, again, a, a typical ecological thing, which is create a mathematical model that simulates the outbreak using all the data from each individual um, barn and each age class of pigs. I didn't do it, just for the record. I really have no idea what they did. It's a series of very intense differential equations. But I do sort of understand what happened. Basically, when you create these equations that describe the dynamics of transmission, and you use the exact size of the pig farm in Malaysia, you can never create an outbreak that lasts for um, 
two years. It always dies out. So if you just look at the green spike, these are the infected pigs. You get this spike in the number of infected. You introduce the virus here. Most of the pigs then become resistant or die, and the virus has no pigs to infect, and it dies out. What happens, though, is if you introduce the virus again, so we make the assumption that bats are constantly flying in and out of these pig farms. And by the way, pig farmers in Malaysia plant fruit trees over the pig styes to provide shade. And these fruit bats love those fruit trees, mango trees, durian. And so the, if, if you assume that they introduce the virus again, the virus persists and lasts for two years. And it's just like the outbreak in Malaysia. So what we found here is that it's not trade that's caused this disease to emerge. It's agriculture intensification, livestock production on a scale that never happened in the past in this country. So you know, this is the first time where we're beginning to show using ecological approaches that intensification of farming systems can cause some really nasty pathogens to come from wildlife. Since then, we've, tr we've tried to do a sort of global analysis of this. I just want to finish off by showing you what we found. We, we created a database of every known emerging disease in people. It's about, there's about um, 400 of them. And we found the first ever reported case of these diseases. And we plotted it on a map. So you can see here straight away, where I'm from, England, is a pretty bad place for emerging diseases. And by the way, New York's not so good either, where I live right now. But of course, this is totally biased because there are more people here working on diseases. There's more money to do studies of infectious diseases. So you discover more diseases. So we got around that by looking at the global effort to identify new pathogens and corrected the database. And then we used this database to test a simple theory. Do these new diseases that are emerging all over the planet, SARS, Ebola, HIV, Nipah virus, West Nile virus, are they related to things that we do on the planet? That's essentially what we've been finding in the research. So can we actually prove that point? So we looked at whether human population density is correlated with the emergence of these new diseases. And we also looked at wildlife. If, if these pathogens come from wildlife, you should see more diseases where wildlife diversity is higher once you've corrected for reporting effort. I won't bore you with the data, but what we find is the hotspots for pathogens, for zoonotic pathogens, are places with high biodiversity and lots of people, where lots of things are happening to the landscape and there are lots of wildlife that carry diseases that could emerge into people. You know, the UK and Europe is still a hotspot because there's lots of food production changes going on there, lots of migration changes. So you still get new diseases, but the real nasties emerge in basically tropical countries. And it's a very important point because we spend most of our money on these pathogens here in the States, whereas what we probably should do is put more effort into these tropical areas where the next one's most likely to come from. Now, uh, uh, just to show you what these places are like, this is Jaldapara Wildlife Sanctuary in, um, in West Bengal, where we have a field site. And what you see is these, th th these are the Himalayan foothills, and you get these beautiful finger-like projections of, of native forest, the last remnants of tiger habitat in northern India. That's a river. And then you get these light areas. That's tea plantations, just solid tea. And then you get these sort of brownie areas. That's people. It's this incredibly dense human pressure on the environment. And this is one of the hottest of the hotspots. People expanding populations, going into wildlife areas, <clears throat> coming into contact with pathogens for the first time and kicking off a new outbreak. And, you know, they're just doing what we do. They just want to live good lives and, and develop and have a car and have healthy kids. So they're not doing anything wrong. And what right have we got to tell them to uh, change their habits? So understanding that people are going to continue to do that, should we be out there working with them to look for the next new pathogen? That's exactly what we're doing now with the PREDICT project with UC Davis as the lead. And um, funded by USAID, specifically targeting those hotspots that we published in that paper and trying to identify new pathogens in wildlife that are related to nasty diseases that have emerged in the past. So I think this is the way of the future, you know, using ecological approaches to deal with what I believe is an eco-health problem, a global problem of public health that comes from what we do to the environment and dealing with those environmental issues to try and stop it. So I want to finish there and just show you all the people that 
collaborate with, including Jonna, who leads the PREDICT um, unit here at the Wildlife Health Centre. And to thank the funders and the bats that um, <laughs> we catch and bleed and anaesthetise and release. Poor things. Anyway, thanks very much. And look forward to questions. Far away. Yeah, we, we found, um, you know, it's quite interesting. When you do those blood meal, you get DNA of skunks, people, horses. We thought we might even get GW's DNA. <laughs> well, that could be cool. You know, once you've got the president's DNA in your pot, that's yeah. worth some money. But I don't know if we ever did. It probably is illegal. Um, we did, we did want to, we wanted to measure the, um, how long mosquitoes live. And there's a way to do that. You, you dye them with fluorescent dye, you release them, and you try and catch them and look for fluorescent stain ones. We weren't allowed to do it because it was too close to the White House and you're releasing things that carry diseases near the present. That's fair enough. They're already out there, right? already out there but that, that doesn't matter. Um, no, so, we, you, you know, you find what, what happens with mosquitoes is they feed on American robins, then at the end of the summer, when American robins fly off, the next preferred food is mammals. The most abundant mammal in those urban areas are people. So they go and feed on people, yeah. which is why you always get late summer... Um, cases in New York and DC and I don't know how it is in in California you don't have diseases out it's so beautiful <laughs> I, know, I know that's true now that's one question come on guys thanks Peter, could you say just a little bit more about what um, Eco Health is doing as part of the um, PREDICT program just to give people a little better idea of what that's about so what we're, what we're trying to do is to do some mathematical modeling to predict where on the planet we should be looking in more detail, where in Brazil should we go to find the most new pathogens? What species should we catch when we're doing our surveillance to get the most new pathogens, the most likely to, to have the next pandemic? And we're also doing surveillance. So we're doing surveillance on wildlife in India, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Brazil, places like that. And you know, we have field teams there. And what we do is we try and work with local teams that we've worked with for years and try and build up the capacity as well. So, yeah, I think it's a good thing. It's, it's helping countries build capacity to deal with the disease that they're on the front line of getting. How important do you think um, is the um, sort of poaching and people going into really rich biodiversity areas and bringing animals out that they're either going to eat or they're going to, um, I don't know, is that something? And how oh, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's hugely important, and it's illegal in some countries, but in a lot of countries, it's just what happens. You know, no one really minds. Um, so it is really critical because if you go into a really pristine forest and build a road, <clears throat> all the all the workers on that road have to, get, have to get food. They go out and hunt for it. It's standard procedure, and they're at the front line of the most biodiverse regions for for catching new diseases. I think there's other things going on as well. There's, you know, in Malaysia, what happened was they built pig farms right on the edge of the town near the forest. So that's even worse. You know, if you've got a big pile of domestic animals that amplifies up a new virus. So there are a few things that people do that are really high risk, and we're working with those communities too. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>
So I'll try not to be too morbid and miserable, but I do have a morbid fascination for diseases that are wiping things out. Um, and what I really want to talk about today is how we've tried to use ecology and bring ecology in, and health together. Really, hard, the hard science of ecology, um, the, the type of approach that's on the planet. So it's quite exciting. You go around there and there's these zookeepers who are obsessed with this. They've got this little plastic box. And I remember going in and uh, this guy was cleaning the cage and he said, here, hold this, will you? And he was sort of ignoring me. I thought, well, I've wasted all my time. Boring snails, about 14 of them in a little box. And he carried on cleaning. He said, by the way, you know you're holding a whole species in your hand. That was incredible. You know, what a powerful moment. So this poor uh, species, Partula turgida, actually died out, it didn't bounce back, and it died on January the 1st, New Year's Day, 1996. Probably really died a couple of weeks earlier, but the zookeepers couldn't tell if it was alive or dead. So they kept, <laughs> they kept a little diary, you know, it's quite sad, you'd go around there. We knew it was dead, and we wanted to get in there and do a necropsy on it and see what killed it, but they wouldn't let us, because they thought it was still alive. That little diary, still not moved. We're getting to really worry about Partula turgida. <laughs> Eventually, they scraped it off the side of the cage and it was dead. It analyzes complex systems to understand how dynamics change and then how that affects disease. And I think this is a sort of new field that's been really developing rapidly. And I want to show a few examples of how we've used that to solve some problems. And I'm going to start with. Maybe I'm not going to start. There you go. Yes, I am. I'm going to start with the first miserable case of extinction due to an infectious disease. Now, these are snails, so they're not the most charismatic species, and people often don't care. But I, I found this really interesting. A few years ago, when I was in England, um, a friend of mine at London Zoo phoned me up and said, we've got real problems, all the snails keep dying out. And we used to have a joke about it. We'd go around to the invertebrate house, and these guys were the most poorly treated zookeepers in the zoo, because no one was interested in invertebrates. They wanted to go and see the pandas. But they were obsessed with their snails. And I realized why. Some of these snails are extinct in the wild, and these are called partula trees. And what killed it were these little um, microsporidium parasites in the liver, the, the, the snail's equivalent of a liver. A raging infection, you can see the um, little sp uh, groups of spores in the, in the um, digestive gland cells. And, whoops. When you look at them on an electron microscope, you can see they've got this coil, which is characteristic of a microsporidium parasite. And, you know, we thought this was quite interesting. There's an extinction happened in London, in the zoo. Um, we told the zoo about it. We said, we really should publish this and get some PR on it. They didn't want any PR that the zoo was killing out species. So that didn't work. But they did put an obituary in the London Times. Partula turgida died at the hand of man, New Year's Day, 1996. It was a sad moment all round. And it turned out that was the first time we could ever say a species definitively went extinct because of an infectious disease. I thought it was really interesting. But when you look around, there are a lot more snails from the islands of the South Pacific. And there were, a group of them went extinct because people introduced a giant African land snail as a food source. And then they introduced a predatory snail to kill that one when the giant African land snail started eating all the crops. And that big snail, the, the, the predatory snail couldn't really kill it. So what it went for instead were these beautiful little tree snails, and it basically ate a third of a genus to extinction. But luckily, a few were kept in zoos around the world, and uh, everything was good for a few years, and people started noticing that populations were dropping in zoos, and then they'd bounce back up and they'd drop. And because there's snails that could go down to one individual animal left in a zoo, and the hermaphrodites that could have babies and bounce back from one, which is pretty incredible. So I got involved in this when there was a... Um, an, an extinction event happening, and this is the animal, it's the last ever of that species to exist.